from Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering AWS reInvent 2018. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services, Intel, and their ecosystem partners. And welcome back here at AWS reInvent. We are live in Las Vegas, day three of our coverage right here on theCUBE, and we continue our discussion now with Justin Moore and John Walls with uh, Matt Yamjishin, who is the Director of Solutions Architecture at AWS. That's right. Matt, good morning, good to see you, sir. Thanks for having me. And uh, Nick Kayu, Vice President of the Global Ecosystem at Pivotal, and good to see you this morning, Nick. Good morning, thanks for having me. All right, first off, let's just get your take on what's happening here. We were talking a little bit before we got started about here we are day three, yeah. uh, well day four if you count the partner conferences, but last day of the show, and there's still a lot of yeah. excitement in the air, the, the show floor is still packed. What have you guys seen this week that's kind of stood out in your mind? That yeah, well, I mean, people stick around for the third day because Werner Vogels is like a hero for so many people here, and so, you know, a lot of the buzz is to see his keynote this morning. Uh, you know, one thing I've been really excited about is all the announcements around machine learning this week. There's just been an incredible amount of innovation, and people are really excited about the Deep Racer and the Deep Racer League announced this morning. So that, you know, the momentum we're seeing and the excitement around machine learning is, is really cool to see. Got and from yeah. your perspective, Nick? I'm joining the marathon uh, towards the middle. I came in last night, Matt and I had dinner, but I think the most uh, impactful announcement I saw come out of AWS was probably the Outpost announcement, yeah. sort of the, the commitment to hybrid, which I don't know, Matt played a, a big role in, in, in kind of pioneering that, and uh, so that's super exciting. And I just can't believe how many people have stuck around. I mean, we're on the last day of this thing, and yeah. it's like, uh, you know, people are, are staying after the party, they won't leave the house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, at four o'clock, they're going to have it. <laughs> we're we're going to kick about. Deep Racer, by the way, we had a couple of guests on. That was a yep. really uh, cool idea about taking literally a small toy truck, if you will, but programming it and, and, and doing some, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, not reflective learning, but uh, reinforced, reinforced learning, reinforced yeah. learning. Uh, with yeah. it, and then actually taking it into practice and putting these cars on tracks and having a year-long competition. So we'll kind of see next year how that works out. Yeah. Uh, AWS and Pivotal. Yeah. All right, so what are the two of you aligned with now? What, what brings the two of you here and the two companies together? Yeah, well, I mean, I think first of all, as companies, we have a lot in common. Uh, certainly, how we think about customers, we're both really sort of customer-obsessed uh, companies. But, you know, what I see a lot, I work with uh, partners all day long, and we want to make it easy for both our customers and our partners to embrace modern DevOps. Like, all these enterprises are going through DevOps transformation, and any tools and partnerships we can create to make that journey easier is really a priority for me and my team. Okay, and then from the uh, pivotal side of the fence. Yeah, I, I would say largely it's our, our customers. Our uh, you know, large portion of our clients have chosen to run Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is sort of our flagship platform as a service um, on AWS. Uh, going back to you know 2014 was the first public IaaS we supported uh, after after vSphere. Um, so you know I think our customers are pushing us to to work together, uh, and I think we've met that challenge. You know one of the things we're here to talk about. Uh, from a pivotal perspective is all the work we've done with Amazon uh, to expose Amazon services to our platform through this technology called a service broker that you know, over the past six months, um, Amazon engineers and pivotal engineers have worked kind of assiduously to deliver to market and now it's getting in the hands of customers. You know, after this session, we're going to go speak with about 50 customers in a, in a private room about how they're deploying uh, Cloud Foundry on AWS and utilizing the service broker to be you know, more productive and drive more innovation of services into their uh, developer community. So what are some of the services customers are, are, are attracted to? What, what are they pushing you to put into this, this service broker? What do they want to do with that? Maybe you can give us a bit of a flavor so, of that. So we came out initially a couple months ago with uh, 18 services that we support. So, uh, you know, things like uh, S3, uh, RDS, yeah. some of the Hadoop offerings. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to see the, the basics, the S3s, probably consumed, you know, first. Uh, but we're working, uh, we're actually putting some ideas together to see how we can build kind of um, uh, reference architectures and paradigms to let our customers know how to take advantage of these services like uh, machine learning yeah. or some of the Hadoop offerings, et cetera. 
Yeah, I mean, we started that with some of the IoT integrations already yeah. through the service brokers, but I agree. If, you know, we're starting with the core services, the, the databases, DynamoDB, RDS, S3, yeah. et cetera, and we're starting to layer in more services over time. Well, you've got to start with the basics so that you can then build upon that, which is exactly. what Amazon has a, a long history of doing. You know, you started with EC2, and then you bring out S3, and now we have services like SageMaker, and then things that drive the car with, with deep research. So it would be nice if we could actually do training models using Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Well, I mean, actually, nothing's stopping you from using, you know, PCF, one, one of the things I love about it is with Cloud Foundry, you can use the service brokers, it makes it easier for you to adopt AWS services, but nothing's yeah. stopping you from using any AWS service, and it's one of actually the great parts of the partnership, so you're not limited to the, what we have service brokers for. Yeah, so enterprises uh, have been going on this cloud journey for some time, yeah. and Amazon's been around for a long time, AWS has had these services for a while, Pivotal as well. Where are we seeing customers, where's the momentum for customers? Where they're transforming their businesses, and we're, we're hearing a lot about hybrid cloud here at the show. Where are enterprises putting their workloads? What are they looking at, at putting workloads into hybrid as compared to putting things over into public cloud or using Pivotal Cloud Foundry for it? Uh, I guess I'll take it from my angle first. Uh, so, you know, approximately 70% of our customers are still running their uh, workloads on-prem, right? Um, that doesn't mean to say that they're not, um, you know, expanding those applications out to, to Amazon, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the key trend we've seen is you know, cloud is becoming more of an operating model, and, and what we focus on is you know, teaching our clients how to build and rebuild software. The, the, the big sort of um, surface area below the iceberg for us right now is all of these enterprise applications, legacy monoliths, yeah. that need to be kind of decomposed and moved into a cloud operating model, uh, modernized through things like data services that we can expose through our platform, uh, to, to something like uh, you know, AWS. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's starting to shift. We were talking earlier uh, about the, the outpost and how uh, I think the, the goal is to kind of meet customers where they are together, if, if, if that's the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, both Amazon and Pivotal. Yeah, I mean, with, with the, the size of customers we're working with, like Comcast and Liberty Mutual and US Air Force, uh, it's not like a single jump into the cloud. It's, it's a migration, a lot of different workloads, a lot of different divisions with these companies. So it's yeah. sort of a continuum. And so companies are at different stages of their migration and adoption of the cloud, all, like all over different parts of their business. So I think the hybrid story is really meeting that need. You have some divisions that are going to jump right into serverless and IoT, um, and then you have other parts of the company that uh, maybe you know, have a mainframe that they're still tied to. So there's always going to be you know, some of these dependencies, and so having a hybrid story allows us to sort of address all different parts of the companies we work with. So, yeah. so what are the factors that, if, I, if I'm looking at you know, a hybrid cloud uh, solution, you know, how do, how do you help people decide what to put where? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you got it on-prem, it's, it's becomes a, you know, a heave, right, to, mm -hmm. to move some things over, and so mm -hmm. it'd be easier to, I guess, take the lightest lift and go from there, but that's not necessarily the best route to go. Bit. So how do you help people with that kind of decision? Yeah, I mean, we believe in the fullness of time that customers will eventually move everything uh, to the cloud, but you know, in the meantime, like I said, it's going to be a multi-year journey for a lot of these big customers. So like, if you take you know, Liberty Mutual or Comcast, these are very large companies, and we work with them to find teams and, and workloads within. That comes down to people a lot of the time. You know, different teams may be at a different point of sort of agility in terms of DevOps, and if yeah. they're um, able to adapt their, their software, if their software runs on x86 infrastructure, if they're already using CI, CD, for example, and if they're used to containers, then they're going to be good candidates. So I always look to the, the people, and, and then the products, and then decide what, what they're going to migrate in that order, so. Yeah, yeah and I would say that, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of big enterprises that are looking to uh, shut down data centers, yeah. and they've already made a decision to fundamentally move infrastructure to uh, AWS, for example, right? And um, a lot of times we, we, we'll be brought in after the fact, if you will, to uh, deliver that developer experience on top of an already made, uh, fundamentally an outsourcing decision. So yeah. all the reasons, you know, cost, complexity, uh, flexible finances, you know, consumption-based pricing, a lot of that kind of substrate decision has already been made. And, and we're generally coming in and saying, okay, now let's look at the application architecture. Are there things like latency and or regulatory requirements that would require you to keep this on-prem uh, versus moving you know, completely to the, to the public cloud? Are there services? So you know, could you move off of legacy middleware, for example, on-prem and take advantage of uh, you know, refactoring and moving applications into the public cloud to improve um, you know, your cost structure there? There's a myriad of issues. Uh, I think we, we would generally agree a lot of times we get um, guidance from our customers yeah. and their respect, respective market segment as to what's most important to them. 
Yeah. So looking ahead, trying to sketch out the vision of, of what we're going to see in the future, what do you think that customers are going to be asking for you for next year, two years out? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've had a great reception for a lot of the, uh, the templates and the automation that we've co-engineered. You know, Nick was talking about a lot of the co-engineering, so we have something called the AWS Quick Stars that allow you to deploy Pivotal Cloud Foundry really quickly. And so we've had really good reception from customers, yep. like things that we can make, make it easier for them to deploy Pivotal and, and sort of explore using it on AWS. So we're going to double down on those efforts, more service brokers, more quick starts, more automation, more self-service for customers so they can get started with Pivotal you know, quickly. Right. Yeah, and I'd add we're also, uh, we support a, a product we launched about three quarters ago, Pivotal Container Service yep. on uh, AWS. And so I think we'll see, uh, by virtue of the, the partnership with VMware, a lot more customer de demand to run PKS uh, you know, on AWS, on Outpost, on VM Cloud for AWS, and all the, all the, uh, the variants of the, the, the VMware and, and Amazon partnership as yeah, well. Like, like you said, meeting customers where they are. That's so. right, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, you're about to meet okay. 50 of them. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. Uh, good luck with that, and I'm sure you're going to get a very positive earful, which is always a good thing, yeah. and uh, continue that great work with them. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having us. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Back with more AWS reInvent. We're live in Las Vegas at the Sands Expo, and you're watching.